It is my privilege then and my distinct pleasure, sir, to welcome you to this campus, to this people, and to invite you to speak to us on the subject of preaching and ethics. Dr. Nigerson. Thank you very much. It certainly is a great pleasure to be here. And for a while there, while you were talking, I didn't want you to stop. It just <laughs> made my day, I'll tell you that. It was just beautiful. But it's, uh, it's great to be here with uh, all of you, and I, I've got over any feelings of, uh, of uh, possibly being a traitor to the cause of Calvinism as I speak to all of you wonderful Baptists, and I think anything I can do that might possibly enhance the quality of Baptist preaching will indeed further the kingdom. And uh, so I, I'm very happy to do that. But it's just uh, wonderful to be here in this place. I, I'm just so delighted to see so many of you here this evening. Uh, ordinarily, I don't become involved in meetings of this kind since uh, my main work is uh, production work in broadcasting. And uh, it's a change of pace for me to be involved in a meeting such as this. But I do welcome opportunities like this because it gives me an opportunity also to reflect upon the activity in which I am involved and an activity in which I know many of you are involved as well. As you know, I'm going to be speaking about the ethics of preaching in this lecture series. And I, and I'm sure many of you who are here tonight, find yourself week after week involved in all that is related to the preparation and the delivery of messages of one kind or another, either in worship services or possibly in the media. And when you're involved in this day after day, sometime you don't really take the time to step back and say, what really is going on and what is happening in this work that I'm doing. So it has been a pleasure for me to prepare myself for this lecture series and to think about this subject which has been troubling me to be perfectly candid with you for about the last five or six years, thinking about the, the ethical dimension of the act of preaching. So I do hope that those of you who are ministers of the word will be able to challenge me possibly with some of your observations and some of your questions. And I see there are many women here and I presume that many of you are wives of clergymen or involved or interested in preaching in one form or another. And I do feel that all of us obviously have a great stake in the health and the state of preaching in our churches, in our denominations, and in the communities in which we live because for some mysterious way, reason, our God has chosen to advance his church in terms of the quality of the proclamation of the word of God. The Bible says, as you know, in the 10th chapter of the book of Romans that faith comes by hearing, faith. So strange when you stop and think about it that this most desirable quality of the human personality, really a metaphysical change that occurs in human beings, is achieved from a human perspective in terms of the fact that a message is delivered. And so we all sense that while it's true that that's not the only way that faith grows, but it is true that as we go to the Bible, we discover that that is certainly one of the major ways that it grows. And so we do all have a stake in the quality of preaching. Just to set the tone for what I will be talking about today and in the next several days, the next three days that follow these, the next three evenings, I want to read a passage 
that in a sense I almost apologize for as I introduce it at the beginning of meetings such as these because it is certainly exceedingly gloomy but it does tell us something extremely important. It's found in the 10th chapter of the book of Leviticus and it is about two people who were serving God and who served him improperly and who were consequently punished. This is the word of God, Leviticus 10. Aaron's son, Nadab and Abihu, took their censers and put fire in them and added incense. And they offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, contrary to his command. So fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Moses then said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke of when he said, among those who approach me, I will show myself holy in the sight of all the people. I will be honored. Aaron remained silent. Moses summoned Mishael and Elzaphan, sons of Aaron's uncle Aziah, and said to them, come here. Carry your cousins outside the camp, away from the front of the sanctuary. So they came and carried them, still in their tunics, outside the camp, as Moses ordered. Now this is very significant because it occurs immediately after the service of the tabernacle had been described and put in place. And almost immediately, as the order of service began to function among the people of Israel, day after day, this event occurred. And it makes very clear, made very clear to the people of Israel, and I think that it has significance for us as well, that when we are involved in a especially significant task in the kingdom, such as preaching most certainly is. We must be aware of the fact that we are involved in an event that stands in a peculiar way beneath the judgment of God. And consequently, we are responsible as members of the Christian community to carefully monitor the exercise of the preaching ministry. And those of us who are called to be involved in the preaching ministry are very responsible to think seriously about the ethical implications of what we're doing as we bring the word of God. Now, as we get into this subject, I would like to take a few moments to explain to you where I'm coming from on this because it may help you understand my motivation as I try to work through this subject and it will also enable you to make some necessary adjustments as you apply what I say to your situation because I'm sure that your situation is somewhat different from mine. But as was mentioned in the introductory remarks, I've been involved in the media ministry since 1960, and I'm very thankful that my denomination, the Christian Reformed Church, thinks su su sufficiently of media ministry to set individuals aside and say to them, now you will be responsible to work in this ministry exclusively. It's interesting that Daniel Barrett whom some of you may know is the editor of the World Christian Encyclopedia, in a new booklet that he has just come out with. He was commissioned by the Southern Baptist Convention in the United States to produce a booklet called World Class Cities and World Evangelism, which some of you perhaps have seen, indicates in there that it's going to be necessary for the Christian community to take media ministries extremely seriously and to set aside and dedicate certain individuals 
to those ministries exclusively. Now, unfortunately, today, when we think about media ministry, we think about some of the most disgraceful episodes that have ever happened in the history of the church over the last several months connected with media ministries. When we think about mini media ministries, we oftentimes think about them in terms of certain high visibility media events which the Christian community has sponsored in one way or another. Some of them with a great deal of glamour, a great deal of glitz, and we say, well, media, many, many people who are in the church, who are, have positions of leadership within the church, say, well, it, that has nothing to do with the church. It's a, it's a strange form of ministry. Serious-minded Christians will frequently talk that way about media ministries. Well, that's sad that that's happened. But I am certainly hoping that the day will come when when mainline Christian people, and when I say mainline now, I'm speaking about those who stand in the tradition of the holy Catholic Church of all ages, the people of God who are self-consciously the people of God will understand that they have to use the media in order to reach the cities, for example, major cities of the world. In any case, I'm very thankful that our denomination, the Christian Reformed Church, for some reason, oddly enough, because it is an ethnic church, basically, and you wouldn't expect it of it, but it's been involved in media ministry since 1939. And it's been a great privilege for me to be involved in radio since 1960, producing messages heard over the radio, basically our half-hour messages called the Back to God Hour. And I don't have any idea how many of these I've done over the years, but when you very, very many of them, because we don't really repeat them at all. And then in 1981, we began our television ministry, which is called Faith 20. And it was very fascinating coming from radio to become involved in television. Because for one thing, I had to change my style completely. When you work in radio, you use a script, of course because of time constraints. In any way, you use a script simply in order to, to uh, use words most economically and to get the point across that you want to get across. You need that. Radio is, is essentially a print medium in every case. Not only religious radio, but all radio is a print medium. It's, it, it's, it involves unloading meaning out of sentences that have been written down, whereas television is totally different. It's a visual medium. And suddenly I found it necessary to adapt or adopt an extemporaneous approach where, as you know, you prepare for something, but you, you don't use a script because when you try to convey something over television, you have to establish some kind of rapport and contact with the people with whom you're speaking. And I might just say our television program is not one in which an evangelist would be speaking to an audience of people, but we use it more as we would use a newscast. And I might say, and that's a whole subject in itself, I think we use it more honestly, consequently. I think that when you say, all right, this is a television program, this is the speaker, and as a speaker, I'm talking to you directly. There's nothing else happening here. It's strictly a communication event. We're talking together. We have some interview programs, but about... I would say 90% of our programs are basically explications of the scripture. On Fridays, we generally have a program that is devoted to church doctrine. I might just say that our program is heard in Canada over the global network in Ontario, and that gives us all of Ontario. And by the way, we have, we're on five days a week, Monday through Friday, and we're on early in the morning. That's the only time we can afford to buy time. In Ontario, we're on 5 o'clock in the morning. People say, it's terrible. It's terrible. It's beautiful. It's beautiful to be on. Because you get people who really have needs. You're not getting church people. When you're, when you're in a secular station... <laughs> ah, there you go. People who know they have needs. That's what I mean. They know they have needs. Alcoholics, drug addicts, 
all sorts of people, people in hospitals, people in jails, people in bus stations, and we're able to talk to them. And uh, we also are on early in the morning out of Chicago on WGN. But what, I'm, what I want to point out is that suddenly here I was, no longer with a script in front of me, looking at a television camera, a couple of television cameras moving around between the two, suddenly confronted with the responsibility of attempting to bring a message in terms of the production constraints that are part of television. And some of you have done television, and you know that it's extremely distracting. There are a lot of things happening. There are people on cameras. They've got things in their ears, and they're talking to somebody back there in the control room, and you're talking to the camera, and you hear them talking together, and all of these things are happening, and, and you're, getting, you're getting directions to move over here and to do this and to move back and to move forward, and all of these things are happening. And, and sometime I would come off the set, and I would think, what is this anyway? Is this really preaching the gospel? And because you're in the, in the production, you see, you're in a production context. And you have to, you have to do a certain amount of acting, too. You, it, it can't be perfectly natural because of what tele television cameras do to you. I remember I, for about two years I didn't wear any makeup. And finally... <laughs> My crew came to me and they said, listen, we really can't have this cadaver on the screen. <laughs> and uh, I said, you mean I, I really have to put all that on my face? I really look pretty good when I get all that makeup on. <laughs> <laughs> and my wife's impressed. <laughs> but, uh, you know, here you're going to go and you're going to, you're going to preach about Christ. You're going to call people to, the, to faith in Jesus Christ and you're making your eyebrows longer than they are by nature. And you think to yourself, what is this? It's artificial. It's artificial. Is this really honest? Is this really honest? And uh, as I work through that in my mind, I finally, you know, you, you start thinking, I'm sure I, all you other ministers here, just like I am, you always think you ought to quit and go somewhere else. And... Uh, then I thought to myself, but the problems that I have with this are really only the problems any minister has, really, when you preach. Because though it is expressed in somewhat different ways, you still have to get ready to preach. There are certain things that are expected of you when you preach, I presume, in your churches, certain clothing that you wear, certain ways of acting. I don't know how people are in your communities, whether you wear robes. I don't wear a robe when I preach, but I know preachers who do, and, and that's certainly an artificial thing. You put on a special robe, and uh, you have all of these different things about this preaching thing. And, and then I thought to myself, well, after all, that is really the same thing that I do when I preach on Sunday, and I preach just about every Sunday in a church somewhere, it's really no different. It's, it's sort of transmuted. The problems are transmuted into a somewhat different intensity, and they're more concentrated when you're working in the media. But really, what the media have done for me is enabled me to see the ethical dimension of the preaching of the word in a way that I had never seen it before. And I began to realize, hey, listen, every time you take a move from here to there, every time you come in close to your audience and you close with your audience and you call them to faith in Jesus and you do it in a certain way, you see, you don't do it one way, but you do it this way, you see, you're making an ethical choice. You make an ethical choice when you do that. There's a tremendous amount of religious television today which is nothing more than audience manipulation. I'm convinced of that. Nothing more than hypnotism. Actually hypnotizing. I've given to my, the people that I work with, very explicit instructions that they may never come in that close to me where they 
bring in a person's face, just about like this. You bring in a person's face like this, and bring your eyes right up to the person that you're talking to. You're using techniques that are of a natural quality, rather than really attempting to bring the power of the Word of God. You see what I'm saying? You see how, how you, make these, you have to make these technical choices when you're in television. But you do the same thing when you're on the pulpit, though you don't realize it as much. And I'll get into that pretty soon as I talk about some of these things. In any case, what I'm trying to say is this, that I think the media confront the Christian community with a new opportunity to examine the ethical quality of the proclamation of the Word of God. And I'm not talking now about the fact that media people have in some instances brought great, dis great disgrace upon the cause of Jesus. That's a fact that they have. But they haven't really done that as media people. They've done that as people who for one reason or another or, or in one way or another have had some very serious character flaws which have expressed themselves in exploiting the opportunity that the, the media give you in order to get rich or in order to to uh, experience a very lavish lifestyle or something of that nature. Th that's really not what I'm talking about when I speak about the ethics of preaching. When I speak about the ethics of preaching in this particular series, I'm talking about the fact that when I stand before people who need to hear about Jesus, and when I stand in the presence of my God with the professed intention of speaking about Christ, at that point, I am in a very, very vulnerable position, ethically. And it's very interesting. It's been very interesting to me as I've thought about this and I've talked with people about this, that it's fascinating that in many instances, we don't think of that as being a point of great ethical vulnerability when a minister is standing on the pulpit. Oftentimes, we automatically think other types of professions as having intrinsic to those professions very serious ethical questions. For example, if someone from your church comes up to you and he's a fine Christian, he says, I'm going to become a doctor. A young man comes up to you and says, I'm going to become a doctor. You say, no, I think that's just great. I hope you realize that we need Christian doctors nowadays because the medical profession is confronted by so many ethical questions. And then you can tick them off for them. And you can talk about various elements of being in the medical profession which are intrinsic to that profession. The very conduct of that profession confronts people with ethical problems. The same thing is true of law. You're in law. You're a Christian lawyer. You're an attorney. You, you recognize at once that in the very conduct of your profession, you are confronted by ethical problems problems. Businessman, the same way. A, a Christian businessman, we say, oh, you're a businessman. It must be really tough to be a Christian businessman because there's so many ethical decisions that you have to make all the time. But we don't often say that about a minister. We don't often say to him, you know, preaching the gospel, oh, you're going to be a preacher. You're going to preach the gospel. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. And we all expect that when people are preaching the gospel and all the congregation is there and the preacher is preaching, something holy is going on, when in fact something unholy may be going on. And maybe nobody's aware of it. But it could be that it's unholy, too, because there are some very serious ethical dimensions that are related to the preaching of the gospel. And I'll get into that yet in this particular lecture this evening. Now, when we talk about preaching in this series, I'm going to be talking about preaching not so much in a theological sense, in a homiletical sense. If we were talking about it homiletically tonight, we'd go back to the Bible possibly and we'd, we'd look at some of the occasions in which preaching occurred. We might talk about some of the words in the original which are used in preaching, which I'm sure that those of you who have taken homiletics courses have been involved in. But when we talk about preaching, 
we're talking about that relatively peculiar event that occurs in the 20th century, or at least in modern church history. I call it peculiar vis-a-vis -vis the long development of church history. That there are preachers called by congregations who serve them sometimes for many years, 10, 15 years, maybe longer. They serve that one congregation, and every Sunday they come on the pulpit, and the whole congregation is there. They know the minister, the minister knows them, they pay the minister's salary, he knows they pay their salary, and you have this situation where you have a congregation and its minister. And every Sunday he's called upon to bring the word of God to them. I say I think this is relatively a peculiar event because I think that in the Middle Ages, for example, the church existed in the Middle Ages. And some of you church historians here may like, might like to, to challenge this. I don't know, but I don't know of many instances of the kind of preaching that we have today where a man is called to serve a church to preach. There were priests, of course. There was a Roman Catholic era, but the kind of preaching that we do today. Of course, we look back and we see great preachers, Whitfield, Spurgeon, we look at them, we say, now those were great preachers. But the kind of thing that we have today, that you have to do if you're a preacher, Sunday after Sunday, and that I have to do, and that we have so many opportunities to do, this particular event, this is what I'm thinking of when I'm thinking about preaching now. That event that occurs, let's say, on a Sunday morning when you're called upon to speak to your congregation. This is the way I view preaching. Preaching is a unique form of human discourse which is authoritative and biblical and apostolic and it is designed to bring about conversion and stimulate piety and equip people to serve Jesus Christ. There is no other form of discourse like this. It's absolutely a kind of discourse by itself. It is authoritative. When a sermon is over, there's only one thing to say. On, be, on the part of the congregation and on the part of the minister. And that is this. Amen. Nothing else. The minister says it not only to signal the end of his sermon, but to signal the fact that he, with his congregation, bows in obedience before the, the word of God that has been expressed. It is biblical. It may be drawn from no other place than the Bible. Its rooted is there. Every message that a preacher brings must be from the book. And every message that he brings consequently must be about the Christ of the book. Every message about this Christ and of course about his cross. And it is apostolic. It stands in the tradition of revelation that involves the prophets and the apostles. It is expressed from out of the frame of reference of that special obedience that those who are called to preach the gospel feel themselves bound with as they understand that they are called upon to bring that message that was first of all delivered to the church on Pentecost. It is a form of discourse that has a very narrow and limited focus and object. It is designed to bring about faith. Faith. I've spoken about faith before. I want to just read a little something about faith that I think is so beautiful. Maybe it won't strike you that way, but I think it's so beautiful. It's a poem written by Emily Dickinson about faith. It's its name. This is the way she described faith. 
Faith is the peerless bridge. That's P-I-E-R, peerless, without a peer, a bridge without a peer. Faith is the peerless bridge, supporting what we see unto the seen that we do not. Too slender for the eye. It bears the soul as bold as it were rocked in steel, with arms of steel on either side. It joins behind the veil to what could we presume the bridge would cease to be to our far vacillating feet, a first necessity, an attempt by Emily Dickinson to describe this strange thing that makes people radically different from each other. That narrow bridge between ourselves and God. And somehow, as the word is preached, that bridge is built in human hearts through the spirit of the living God. That is the purpose of this proclamation. That and also a stimulation of piety that we with our congregations may learn what it means to live in communion with our Savior every day in the practice of prayer and the reading of the word and the expressions of Christian mercy. And with all this, our preaching is designed to enable people in every area of life to express their allegiance to Jesus and demonstrate that they are not their own, but they belong to their precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's their king, and they want to serve him, whether they're businessmen or lawyers or doctors or housewives or architects, whatever the case may be. <coughs> preaching. Preaching, that's what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about that event that occurs right there within a church as you as a preacher, those of you who are, stand before the congregation and bring them the sacred word of God. Now, when you bring the word of God, there are a number of things that can happen that are dismally immoral grievously immoral. We express the ethics of preaching in terms of the choices that we make, in terms of how much time we decide to spend on actually bringing the message of the word and how much time in application and how much time in calling people to faith and how much time in telling stories, being entertaining. When you are telling stories, when you are being entertaining on the pulpit, when you're doing that, you can't do other things because you're taking your time doing that. There are choices, choices that relate to rhetoric and how you, you apportion the message that you put together. There are also things that can be done in terms of simply filling time. You know, the ministry is a strange work, really. When you begin to be a minister, and those of you who are possibly still students here in this college, you'll be able to identify with this. I think when you begin, the thing that you would just like to be when you preach, just a little bit. You'd like to at least preach acceptably. Acceptably. If only you could do that. Then you'd like to preach effectively. After a little while, and you've learned how to preach acceptably, say, well, I said I'd really like to preach at least effectively. In fact, I find that most of the time when we as preachers think about preaching and when we talk about preaching, that's generally what we talk about, how we can be effective 
how we can, that's one of the worst things that's happening in the 20th century today is that there's some tremendously effective preachers, fantastically effective. And they're not even liberal, but they're not bringing the word of God. And you can listen to them for a half hour and you say, it wasn't easy to listen to. It was. But you never came face to face with the crucified Jesus Christ. I've sat in church services that way where ministers have been very easy to listen to. And I've walked out of there and I've thought how terrible these people don't even realize that they haven't been fed with what they need the most. Jesus the Savior. But that's what we think about. We think about effectiveness. We want to preach acceptable sermons. We want to preach effective sermons. And you want to be able to fill the time that you have allotted to you. And there's a lot of preaching that goes on simply so you fill the time because you know how long you have to speak. How long they figure on your speaking. 8.30 for me tonight. <laughs> and so there are choices that you're making all the time while you're making your message in your study or while you're making your message on the pulpit as you deliver your message you're making choices so those are ethical dimensions deciding how you're going to handle the scripture how much time you're going to spend with this how much time you're going to spend with that whether you're really you find ways of being effective or are you simply going to use those ways to be effective simply to be effective so that when the people go home they say now wasn't that a good sermon or wasn't that a literary sermon or wasn't that some other kind of sermon that people want. So you try to give them that kind of a sermon. Those are ethical choices. Another very important thing, I think, when it comes to preaching is the matter of manipulating people. Manipulating. And I've seen this on television. I, and I, I've mentioned this already, but I just want to underscore it. Television is the most manipulative medium that has ever come into existence. I believe that sincerely. I, I don't really believe we know what television is doing to modern perceptions and to the way people really experience reality today. It's extremely manipulative. And one of the things when you've worked in television somewhat, it's very difficult to watch television because you realize that they're playing games with you. It's so easy to play games with television. But it's not only, but preachers don't only play games in television. But preachers tend to play games anywhere and everywhere once they learn how to do it, once they've developed the, the technique. And each one of our traditions is different. Some of you may be Pentecostal. They have certain ways of working with their congregation. And if you're not a Pentecostal and you watch enough, you say, I, I see what they're doing. I see what they're doing. And I said, I said, I pointed out to one of my friends one time, I said, you know, I see what these Pentecostals are doing. He says, okay, that's right. But he says, you know, we reform people. We do the same thing, only we do it differently. And I says, no, that isn't true. <laughs> he said, sure it is. <laughs> he says, sure it is. And he opened my eyes and he pointed out different things that we did on the pulpit Sunday after Sunday. And we did it a certain way. And we knew that if we did certain things, we used certain words, we, we raised our voice in a certain way or something, we had our way of manipulating the people. So what about Baptists? Do they have anything like that? <laughs> I see. Okay, you can just cross that out of your notes. <laughs> but I think it's, it's a very serious thing. And I, it's probably not something that a beginning minister will get involved in. But when a person does become effective, that's the danger point. That's the real danger point. Because when you have the tools and you know how to use the tools, there's no question about that. I mean, people can become skilled at doing all kinds of things and they can become skilled at being preachers. There's no question about that. But when you have the skills and you have the tools, that's when the responsibility becomes terribly great that you don't simply start 
manipulated the people who are there. And then there is something I think that we do so very easily, and that is this, and that's pretty much related to everything else I've said, but it kind of brings it together. We who preach a lot and finally become able to preach, and certainly we can preach acceptably in our congregations, we can come to the point where we are habitual preachers. And I'll tell you what I mean by that, habitual preachers. I was reading an article of criticism of Emily Dickinson the other day, and this gentleman said, and he was talking about her, and I don't know how much she means to you, but she happens to be a poet I love a great deal, and I just am very fascinated by what she's done. She's written some absolutely marvelous poems, and some of them which are not at all. And he said this, Emily Dickinson had the habit of writing in a certain way. And she would often write from out of the fruit of a deep wrestling with a great idea. And as she wrote out of that deep wrestling with that great idea, her writing would take a certain form. And she developed her habits by that deep wrestling with great ideas. But he said, sometime when she didn't have anything to say, she would still write the same way. Because she developed the habit by wrestling with the great ideas. And I thought to myself, that's it. That's what we preachers do. We do have our high points or our deep points when we are wrestling with the Scripture. And we have our great spiritual moments, grand, glorious moments. We're living close to Jesus. And there will be certain sermons that grow out of that experience. And we can develop a habit, the habits that we use in preaching at times like that. But oftentimes we may find ourselves preaching by habit in terms of ways that we develop them. But our hearts are dry and sear, and we are far away from God. And this is why sometime you can have it. And I've seen it happen, and I know every one of you here tonight has seen it happen too. You can have a minister of the gospel who at the very time of his life when he is turning his back upon God and possibly doing something ugly and horrible in the church. And people discover it later and they say, well, how could it be? He was preaching so beautiful, beautifully, while all that was going on. Well, that was his habit. He had developed the habit when he was living close to Christ. So that even when he was far away from him, he was involved in habitual preaching. And that's something else that we can do. As I conclude tonight, I would just like to say this. I mentioned a few moments ago that I've been really impressed by the fact that so many people have not really thought at all about the ethics of preaching, of the act of preaching, the vulnerability of the preacher when he preaches. How strange that is when you stop and think about it. I, I was reading from the 10th chapter of the book of Leviticus. When you go to the Bible, the villains of the Bible are the priests, the prophets, the religious leaders. They are the villains of the Bible in the Old Testament and the New Testament. If there is any message that comes across from the pages of the Bible. It's this. Before you start worrying about the drug addicts and the prostitutes, you better worry about the religious leaders. And I don't want to be dramatic about this or anything, 
I am just so impressed by this. But you find it. The 18th chapter. Of the book of Deuteronomy. This is where we read. This is about Christ, actually. The 17th verse. The Lord said to me, What they say is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth and he will tell them everything I command him. This is a a prophecy about Jesus Christ who is going to come. This was applied to Jesus later on, as you know. If anyone does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name, I myself will call him to account. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded him to say, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, must be put to death. Now just think of it. A prophet who speaks anything in my name that I have not told him to say. You have to put him to death. As a preacher, I read that, and I just tremble at what I read. This is in Deuteronomy already, and you go through this. You come to the book of Lamentations. And you read about the, the terrible thing that have happened to the people of the fourth chapter. With their own hands, compassionate women have cooked their own children who became their food when my people were destroyed. The Lord has given full vent to his wrath. He has poured out his fierce anger. He kindled a fire in Sion and consumed her foundations. The kings of the earth did not believe, nor did any of the world's peoples, that enemies and foes could enter the gates of Jerusalem. But it happened because of the sins of the prophets and the iniquities of her priests who shed within her the blood of the righteous. The downfall of the Old Testament people of God was caused by the corruption that was found among the religious leaders. And you go to the 12th chapter of the book of John and you find Caiaphas after Lazarus had been raised from the dead. And he says, listen, we're not getting anywhere at all. What has to happen is that we have to kill this man, Jesus, because it's better that one man die than that the whole, mer- than the whole nation perish. That was a religious leader who said that. Now, I often think of that chapter in the Brothers Karamazov. And you know it too, probably, if you've read that. Aloysia and Ivan are talking together and Ivan tells him the dream he had about the great and the grand and inquisitor. You know that chapter from that book? The grand and inquisitor. He was a Spanish bishop who was killing off the heretics. And Jesus Christ came to the city. And the bishop looked at him and he knew right away who he was. He put him in jail. And he went and visited him in his cell. And he said to Jesus Christ, he said, Jesus Christ, you had no business coming back and disturbing our world and what we have put together. And sometimes religious leaders, even today, can be so involved in their ministries and their projects and all the things that they're doing, sometimes you wonder, do we really want Jesus to come back? Jesus, finally. Oh, it's an awesome thing to be a preacher of the gospel. You're a preacher, in a sense, you can't think about it too much because if you do, you can't do your job. But you do have to think about it. And you have to understand that when you stand before the people of God and you presume to speak in the name of God to these people, 
you're in a situation of great ethical vulnerability. It takes a lot of prayer. It takes a lot of understanding of what's going on when you preach. And I'd like to talk about some of that further in the other evenings. Thank you very much. Thank you.